So the inaugural NASCAR Cup Series weekend in St. Louis at the Worldwide Technology Raceway is over. This was a race hyped up, not only because the track is unique, it is different from the NASCAR norm, but also because the track promoters really promoted this as a different race. We were going to see a different experience compared to the SMI and ISC tracks on the schedule. They talked the talk, but the question was, could they walk the walk? I attended all four days, the Fan Fest, the Richard Petty Day presented by Bomberito, the Toyota 200, and the Enjoy Illinois 300, the big show on Sunday, and I gotta say there were some things that were good, some things that were bad, and some things that were ugly about this inaugural weekend at the Worldwide Technology Raceway. So of course we're going to start out with a good and that has to be when I walked through the gates at the Worldwide Technology Raceway for Friday and saw the immense improvements they did to the racetrack. It's one thing to hear that they were talking about the improvements but to see them in person is another story. They obviously repaved a lot of things. They added some brand new pedestrian bridges which were awesome. You didn't have to climb over the drag strip to get to the racetrack in the midway. The only problem with that is the line after the race was pretty long to get through the bridges and the easy fix for that is to just add more bridges and hopefully for the 2023 running they add some more pedestrian bridges so fans can get from the midway to the parking lot a lot quicker and that leads into the biggest surprise of the weekend as a lot of people thought that this race that this track was going to produce Carmageddon 2.0. It seems like a lot of inaugural races have this issue of getting people in and out of the racetrack. However, in Worldwide Technology Raceway's case, they did a fantastic job with the parking. The longest wait I had to go through was on Sunday getting to the racetrack as we screwed up uh, the exit to go to the orange parking lot. However, even with that, we still got to park within 20 minutes. So this was around 10, 11-ish getting to the racetrack. And I noticed I was watching uh, from the grandstand to see how people were getting into the racetrack. And by 1.30, there was no line of cars. There was minimal weight to get into the racetrack and park. As believe it or not, yes, with the congested crowd, with a lot of people trying to leave, we got out of there within 15 minutes in the big race, which is something that didn't happen at tracks like Chicagoland and Kansas in their 15th to 20th race that they've hosted. And then of course the midway was fantastic, you had a lot of sponsor and vendor booths and then you had something completely unique, at least from the racetracks I've been to, where they had two jumbo sized TV screens right outside the start finish line where you could watch the race. And this would come in handy with one of the experiences I had as we will get to that towards the end of this video. And then of course the connection in terms of the Wi-Fi was awesome. The only issues I had was with my phone for some reason having temperature issues. But obviously that does not relate to the service itself. As Worldwide Technology you could tell they put a lot of effort into making this a connected facility, a 5G facility. So those are just some of the bells and whistles. So now we're going to look at the goodish neutral part and that is obviously the racing product. First off, we got to start with the truck race, which was absolutely phenomenal. Stage one seemed like was a shakedown to kind of get things going. And unfortunately, I was not able to see the first 20-ish laps of the race, which we will get to towards the end of the video. But obviously, from what I saw, it seemed like it was going to be a KBM runaway. Then we get to stage two and it seemed like the track got a lot racier and we saw a lot of guys make some daring moves. John Hunter Nemechek made a mistake and ended up wrecking himself out of the race. We had Grant Enfinger and Chandler Smith go for it and that really put them behind. With all the unpredictability we got to see some new faces compete for the win for a change which we got to see Derek Krause who made a phenomenal outside pass late in that race and it looked like he was going to get that win. And then obviously Christian Eckes who would make the pass on him back and it looked like he was going to get the victory. Then of course you had the thrilling overtime. Corey Heim would end up winning that event to really solidify that he is a legitimate driver and didn't have to rely on winning just at Trashlanta. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this was not only the best race under the Curtis Francois era, but it was potentially the best truck race ever, or the best truck race all around for the Gateway International Raceway or the Worldwide Technology Raceway. And the statistics really back that up as typically this is a track that only has 600 to 700 passes. The 2021 race set the record with 955. 
Meanwhile, with this race, the 2022 running, it had 1,460 green flag passes. I'm not exactly sure what was the root cause of this, but holy crap, the truck race was phenomenal. It had everything you wanted, unpredictability, chaos, you had some passing, you had some passes on the outside, you had an overtime, a thrilling overtime finish. There was nothing more you could ask from from this truck series race, the Toyota 200. So obviously that was an appetizer to a cup race where we were not sure what type of racing we were going to see. I thought it was going to be a better version of Phoenix. I'm sure many of the track promoters thought this was going to be race of the year. And then you had some of the drivers who predicted that this was going to be a race with not a lot of passing. Chase Elliott predicted that restarts and strategy was going to be key and this was going to be a lot like Martinsville in the spring where there was basically no passing for the lead. And in many ways, he was right as during that first stage, the racing was absolutely horrible in terms of passing for the lead. The only pass was Austin Cindric on Chase Briscoe because Chase Briscoe had a blow job on the front stretch, which ended up losing him two laps. And in that case, Austin Cindric took the lead. But beforehand, it seemed like Austin Cindric, he would get close to Chase Briscoe, but you know, with the dirty air, he just could not get close to Chase Briscoe to make the pass. However, in that second stage, Ross Chastain, when he got into Denny Hamlin, that really set the tone for the race. I don't know whether it was the fact that it was an indication of the field that passing was going to be tough. I don't know if it was the cautions breed cautions, or I don't know if it was the more pit stops, the more rubber getting laid down that really helped the racing come into play. But after that, the event, the 300 mile race really started to pick up because we had things happen. We had the situation with Ross Chastain and Denny Hamlin, obviously, where everyone was glued to the back of the pack. Yeah, believe it or not, we come to a NASCAR race to watch the front of the field, and yet everyone was sitting there on the edge of their seat watching 30th place to see whether Denny Hamlin was going to pay back Ross Chastain and take him out of the race. You had that, and then you had the situation with Chase Elliott in which he would tag team with Denny Hamlin to pay back Ross Chastain in a way. And in many ways, this race felt like a mixture of Martinsville. I'm talking about the good Martinsville with a lot of the drama, a lot of the tempers and banging doors. And then Pocono, where there was a lot of strategy in this race. Track position was critical, you know, getting into the first two to three rows. You know, you had to be up there if you wanted to have a shot at this race. However, I really noticed that the track started to gain character in that third stage, especially during the final stretch of the race, the final 10 laps, where it seemed like Joey Logano could catch Kyle Busch. He was closing in, and ultimately we would not find out if Joey Logano could make that pass on Kyle Busch late in that race because Kevin Arvick had his blowjob, which sent us into overtime where we got to see Kyle Busch and Joey Logano side by side trading paint, or should I say vinyl, since these cars are all wrapped nowadays. We got to see Kyle Busch take the lead, then he obviously overshot it a bit, went up the racetrack, Joey Logano pulls the crossover, and Joey Logano wins the inaugural Enjoy Illinois 300. When we're talking about an inaugural race, I would say that this was the best of the races that we've seen since 2021. This race, it had drama, it had strategy, it had some close quarter racing. Yeah, we didn't really get to see this race under a green flag run, but for the most part, there was nothing truly horrible about this race that really put people to sleep or really said, hey, Worldwide Technology Raceway might not be the best venue to hold a NASCAR Cup Series race. So now we're going to get to the bad, and that has to be the pre-race, as if you guys don't know, obviously there was a Confluence Festival kind of intertwined with the Enjoy Illinois 300 inaugural NASCAR Cup Series race. And in a way, during that pre-race, if you were in attendance, you really saw this, as it kind of felt like the Confluence Festival and the race itself were kind of competing with each other, which was really annoying. Because on one end, on the front stretch, you had the majestic Budweiser Clydesdales march down the front stretch, and it was something spectacular. However, on the Wallace Tower, towards the turn one side, you had Cole Swindell, award-winning artist who was playing music for the fans, and in that situation, it was just a mess. It felt like the concert and the Clydesdales, they were competing with each other, and that is not what you want. In this situation, you want the race, you want this to be united as one, and this was just an absolute mess. Oh boy, so here we go. We're going to get into the absolute ugly about this inaugural NASCAR Cup Series race at the Worldwide Technology Raceway, and that is hands down the food 
and vendor situation. It was absolutely atrocious. As I'm going to say this, you know, Worldwide Technology Raceway, they did a lot of things right, but this is the one instance where I wished it would have been ISC or SMI running this race. Because in the truck series race, or before the truck series race, we decided to get food 45 minutes before the green flag for this race. Or I believe it was an hour because you have the pre-race festivities and then you have the race. We get down there and the lines are extremely crowded. So I try to find a place that doesn't have a line. We went to the Domino's, which was not that crowded. We went up there. They were out of pizza. We went to another Domino's, and they weren't taking orders. And then we went to one of the restaurants inside, and they weren't selling food. So then we had to go to one of the lines. We had to go into the rat race to get food. And from there, the line was absolutely atrocious. It seemed like nobody moved. It was a slow, slow line. People were not getting their food in a quick and timely manner. And I was frustrated. I went up there, you know, when I finally got my order and I said, you know, this was a horrible, you know, experience. We waited 30 to 40 minutes in this line to get food. I hope this is not the situation for Sunday. And after saying that, the gal who was running the cashier told me that, well, it is going to be exactly like this for Sunday. That is just how it is going to be. And to an extent, I do not blame the staff working there. As she said that they were understaffed in this situation. Obviously, across the country, there are a lot of labor shortages when it comes to retail, when it comes to restaurants, and obviously in this situation, when it comes to running the concessions for a professional sporting event. Still, this is not an ideal situation to have fans waiting in line, waiting to get food while the race is going on, while they're missing out on the thing they came to, the thing they paid for. That is not an ideal thing to happen. Now, fortunately, this is one of the things that you can avoid as obviously you can either eat a big breakfast or you can do what I did on Sunday, pack a Subway sandwich, pack a cooler full of water so where you got into a situation where you didn't have to go and wait in the rat race just to get food, which was obviously, once again, horrible on Sunday. So there you have it, guys. The good, the bad, and the ugly of this first NASCAR Cup Series weekend at the Worldwide Technology Raceway. And if there are three things I want to see changed, number one, I think we need more pedestrian bridges so that fans can get to the parking lot quicker. Number two, Bring the NASCAR Xfinity Series to Worldwide Technology Raceway so that we can have more rubber down for the cup race. And then number three, I think that the food situation needs to be improved. And how I would do that is that I would ask ISC and SMI how they do it, how they cater to the Daytona 500 and the Coca-Cola 600. Because I believe that the Worldwide Technology Raceway for this event, rumor has it that they got the same crew from the Churchill Downs that did this race. But overall, I think this first weekend, it was a solid weekend because the two biggest issues were the parking and the racing. The parking, it was not Carmageddon 2.0. The racing, it was not Martinsville Spring. And in a lot of ways, it was a positive experience. I think 9 out of 10 people, I would say, had a lot of fun this weekend, didn't have a lot of issues. The drivers seemed like they were thrilled with this because you had Kurt Busch, Denny Hamlin, Joey Logano, and Brad Keselowski all endorse NASCAR in St. Louis and the Worldwide Technology Raceway facility. And I think with that, you have a lot of momentum from this race in the St. Louis market. And you also have a lot of things to kind of promote as the Worldwide Technology Raceway team in their commercials. They can market the drama between Ross Chastain and Denny Hamlin. You know, the intensity of getting track position. I think that's going to be something that they should go for when trying to lure in fans for the 2023 running. Plus, in terms of the marketing to get people out, I mean, honestly, they could just show the entire national anthem from that race. Because I'll tell you, that national anthem, the best national anthem ever. It really made you feel like you were in something special. You were in a marquee event. Either way, I would say the first weekend, it was a success. I'd give it a 7 or 8 out of 10. There are things that could be improved, but certainly this is a strong start for NASCAR in St. Louis. So anyways, guys and gals, this is NRF Productions signing out. And just remember, life's a beach and then you drive.